now or in Washington. Uh, yeah, well, you see, the, uh, after this uh, dictatorship we had like, for 25 years, uh, when the country was so closed uh, and the youth was leaving in mass the country, not having any you know, chance to express themselves properly, uh, and the new generation grows, and now we kind of finally having at least some uh, fresh air, some space uh, for self-expression, and we see the huge demand over youth for this self uh, self-expression, and you know, like they're like all of them right now on TikTok or whatever, like internet, with Instagram, with all, all of these things, and uh, <laughs> they see how like how what happens in the world, right? You cannot hide it anymore. And like uh, you have a VPN or uh, whatever, like, uh, and of course you're starting to kind of uh, uh, get more interested. You kind of asking the questions and all of it, and uh, and the art form is like the easiest. Uh, form of expression and now it's kind of become so possible like with, uh, with your camera on your phone right like doing even like a simple things uh, and this also explains why I have like uh, blogging is booming uh, in Uzbekistan you have like enormous amount of bloggers right now um, and I'm really happy that in, in, especially in Tashkent we started to have like street artists lots of them and like who like folks, young folks are going to be less afraid of them in doing that. And, and like for me and like my team it was quite obvious to you know just to uh, grant this space, grant this uh, opportunity uh, to all of them, you know, just to to do that, to do what they're already doing. And of course the, those uh, critical questions always being raised. Back out them with your expertise, like with some curatorial work, just to navigate them a bit, and, and that's it. And kind of having people coming and like, and I, and I'm really proud of what we kind of have done in three years. Of course, in the very beginning, everybody was kind of really afraid of us, keeping a bit of distance, you know. And it took some time, slowly, step by step, seeing that yeah, it's kind of a, it is important, and it, it is cool. Now I'm kind of can easily say that we're having our events. We have like up to a thousand people like coming, even though we're like we're, we're twice smaller than this whole, you know. Like and people are coming and just hanging out all the time, and we're like creating more space for them. Libraries, something like you know, just uh, quite recently launched a market where the youngsters can uh, show their work, you know, sell it, make some profit for themselves, and then I think the end and then goes really cool and this kind of a, through this they kind of a, uh, through the art they uh, they finding that uh, it can be a, a unique universal language to express yourself to to raise the questions right and of course uh, uh, authorities are also keeping look at it of course uh, but we are kind of a bit happy that they don't really the language of art yet. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, what can possibly go wrong for the art, right? <laughs> very true, and it's very exciting what you've been able to accomplish. It's truly incredible. Um, and now, if we can go back to Sandy Vasantrovich and dig in a little deeper into the situation in Kazakhstan, which arguably is less than north than other Central Asian countries by Russian aggression and the war in Ukraine to share a long border with Russia. And you're also um, trying to deal with what happened during bloody January last year and the many deaths that resulted. What role can civil society play or has played already in trying to demand government accountability for bloody January and more broadly demand figuring out how to channel legitimate public discontent into constructive action or engagement with the government? First of all, we have to be very clear with the conditions. What do we mean under the civil society? The 
very important issue because sometimes we are confusing society and civil society. Now these are two different concepts. Society exists everywhere. Uh, organi civil organizations exist in Soviet Union, like veterans organizations, or pensioners organizations, or women organizations, or children organizations. Why we're not calling it civil society? Because it's not the word civil. It has to be the last word, society. There is a lot of good organization inside the society which are dealing with the social problems, which are trying to solve them, which try to get the funds, which try to get support inside the society as such among the population. But when we are turning to the civil society, the word civil is key. That this organizations or groups or individuals were able to raise issues, were able to make demands to the government, to try to oppose, try to be the opponent, try to provide something, who try to speak equally to the government. This is civil society in uh, my opinion. And sometimes I'm looking, for, especially last year, I'm looking at Russia and, uh, and see what happens with the civil society there. And I try to analyze. I'm in this field for more than 30 years. I, I'm watching in my eyes how everything developed in Russia and also in space, how this civil society organization starts to emerge. And it was already said 30 years of my organization, which I founded in 1993. And I understand that if for many years the government is cracking down on any dissent in its rightized form, I mean political parties, independent trade unions, uh, mass media, and so on, then the civil society as such is not growing. It's, it's in a small number of organizations and people. And in the last probably 10, 15 years, I looked at this group of organizations, at these people, at these individuals, without any political position in place, because there is no political participation in reality. And even the last elections in April, which uh, were the first chance in the last probably 15 years when there was some kind of competition, because they allowed 30% uh, to run the elections in the so called single Monday district, and we see some districts with the 47 candidates, and some of them were in the opposition. Uh, they lost because of the actions were, as usual, uh, not fair and not free. But it looks like, again, I remember beginning of 90s when it starts flourishing, it starts developing. Then stagnation, and now again. Of course, uh, general events were some kind of pushing point. Yes, of course, it was clear that even in the cases in uh, during gender events and the last oil workers uh, protests in Astana and in the West of Kazakhstan shows what it is when you do not have independent trade unions. You don't know whom you could talk to, should talk to. There is no leaders. There is only people in the streets or people uh, protesting near the Katun Naigaz building and so on. That's when we're looking at that. We see how again this small civil society again starts to broaden, starts to, to enlarge itself. There is new people, you see blockers, you see more active discussions in the social networks, and more demand. Demand exists. Institutionalization of demand does not exist to the extent when it is possible to talk to the government. That's why. From my point of view, what we are doing, I think we are doing what we can. We are raising the issues, we are demanding, we are issuing uh, the reports. We are organized immediately after the during the general events, we uh, initiated the civic uh, human rights islands uh, on fundamental rights, on traditional fundamental rights. We are doing our job in documenting the events. We will produce the report in the near future. But at this point, it looks like it's only starting to develop. And the key problem is how this demand, these expectations of the population will be initialized 
and channel in a certain organized way. I am from all my public career for 30 years, I'm a moderate optimist. I use this very strange word that on one hand I'm moderate, on the other hand my experience shows that I'm an optimist, and on the other hand my experience shows that I have to be moderate. That what we are witnessing now, we are witnessing how the system again faces the problem of Soviet past, how to overcome that, how to start to reform that, and how to engage again the society to become the civil society. The society to initialize itself and express itself. The process underway, I see more and more youth involved, more, probably maybe not directly in politics, but in some feminist issues, and some issues of ecology, and some issues of culture, as uh, you said, there starts to be the junior generation which want to be free, first of all. They are others. They have not been born in Soviet Union. They look at the world in another way. They still have not translated these uh, expectations into Israelized form, into civil society as a big sphere. Because civil society is not NGOs. Civil society is uh, people, it's uh, individuals, it's organizations, and it initiatives, it's the whole big sphere. And this sphere, hopefully, in the last couple of years, especially after the Mr. Nazarbayev uh, stepped down, and my first uh, comment on that was uh, when I was asked by the media, what do you think about uh, Mr. Nazarbayev stepped down? I said that the, only, that the best thing is to have two presidents instead of one. Some kind of, certain kind of contributions. <laughs> and I think that now we are moving forward in that regard, and this is this is like that, that it starts boiling. To what extent these expectations will be met, to what extent this move will be institutionalized in a certain way, we'll see, and then we will talk about to what extent civil society is influenced. At this point, of course, it's trying what it could. But again, my final point, you have to keep in mind, and I think it's for the many researchers in the future and so on, to look at these 70 years of Soviet past, what it did to the social habits, to the practices, to the society as such. It was ready to tear the world up, if you now see every Russia, all in Russia and so on. It's very important. Yes, the Zetalash, especially in Kazakhstan, it starts to be more vibrant, it starts to be Forward, but it's very difficult to overcome this, especially when you're dealing with the same Soviet institutions and the same still plutocratic system uh, with the buildup of communist ideology, but a very good and strong administrative command system, as it was uh, mentioned in the Soviet Union. Thank you, Alexander. And I absolutely agree with what you're saying, but I don't want us to underestimate the degree to which over the past several years since President Nazarbayev stepped down, how much of a renaissance there has been in Kazakhstan in terms of new civic initiatives, mm -hmm. new activists becoming engaged, particularly in the regions, particularly mm -hmm. among the Kazakh language population. It's been stunning to watch uh, my first trip to the regions was in 2014, and we had trouble finding people to work in the remote regions. The latest couple of trips, we can't possibly meet the demand of all of these new initiatives, and that gives me a lot of hope for the future and for overcoming these post-Soviet uh, legacies I, that you mentioned. I hope they're boiling. Yes, yes. 